Welcome to Yacht Crew Vlogs, where we tell the stories of those in the yachting industry. A behind the scenes look that discovers the individuals in the industry, their history, their passions, and what inspires them to do what they do. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Yacht Crew Vlogs right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I am your host, and I'm very pleased to welcome my next guest, Peter Herzler. Um, and I'm trying my best to get that right. He is the uh, founder and managing partner of Ocean Independent. I have to say, in doing the research for you, your biography is absolutely astounding. You were a merchant deck officer. Then you took your Dutch Master Mariner Certificate in 1985. Uh, you were the creator of one of the first owner-operated luxury cruise charter companies, which I think went on to become Ocean Cruise. Uh, you were also captain of the first vessel of the fleet. You also served as three terms past president of NEVA, and now you are the owner of the world's largest central agency listing of accrued luxury super yachts and more. Tell us a bit about yourself. Where are you from and where did your journey start? Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, first, and, uh, and happy to be here. And thank you, Ria, for your introduction. Uh, as you would expect from the media nowadays, there was a little bit of exaggeration here and there, of course, but, uh, but I like the enthusiasm. And, uh, and yeah, just happy, happy to be here. And, uh, and, and yeah, I, when I listen to what you said, and I realize how old I am, and but I also realize how many, many good years I did have and how much I enjoyed to be in yachting since my early, well, my late 20s, actually, when we did indeed start uh, what used to be called Columbio, the Columbio sail cruises, three, three, eventually three motor sailors that were, yes, that's true, the first commercial yachts on the water. Uh, and we talk about, uh, yeah, uh, early 90s, late 80s. So, yeah, long, long, long way since then. But very enjoyable, great industry, lots of friends in the industry, and of course, fantastic clients. And you are Swiss? I am I'm very Swiss, yes, indeed, whatever that means. Uh, and um, I'm very lucky as well because I'm married to a Dutch girl, a Dutch woman, uh, who I met when we did build the, the first of the Columbios in the, uh, as I said, you know, mid 80s. And, um, and well, we, we have a great life together. I think the mix of, um, of a Swiss man and the Dutch woman must be one of the best, uh, at least, you know, that's how I feel about it. I'm a very, very happy and lucky. Okay, man. What brought you to become a, a merchant deck officer? What was sort of your pull, uh, you know, firstly, of course, to being a mariner, um, but to the choice of being a merchant deck officer? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I, that was sort of like the last plan I ever had when I was, a, when I was going to school in Switzerland. Um, it was actually the way, the, the case that my brother, who always wanted to become a captain on, on seagoing ships, and I always wanted to become a lawyer. Uh, the result was that he's now a lawyer and I have been, uh, you know, for a short period, a captain on seagoing ships. And, and it, I was really drifting towards that. I was, uh, I was starting studying law in Zurich. I did then go to South Africa. I went to the army in Switzerland. Didn't like to go back to studying at university and somehow, you know, long story, but uh, somehow ended up on a Dutch cargo vessel as an apprentice deck officer and, um, and never looked back and, and just went on uh, to, uh, to the master license and then uh, had been sailing with the family for quite some time in Scandinavia on a, on a, on a small sailing boat and knew the pleasures of yachting, the fantastic experiences that you can have when you are in a small port, in a small bay at anchor. And, and so my brother and I, with some friends at some stage, decided that we wanted to do that as a business. Uh, combine the professionalism of what I'd learned on the on the cargo ships with the the joys of uh, being on a private yacht and uh, and and doing doing things in in a small environment and and so we came up with these first motor sailors, 120 feet. Uh, at that time in the late 80s, um, you know, really big yachts, super yachts nowadays, you know, wouldn't make it very very high up on any list. But at that time, those were big yachts. And, uh, and it was a big adventure, and that's how we got started. Wow. So that is sort of a love of the sea as well, with your family. 
Very much so. Yes. I mean, we always, uh, a, a vacation without some water nearby somehow is difficult even now. Um, uh, winter vacation is on snow, so that's frozen water, so that's fine. But other than that, uh, you always need to be somewhere near the water. A river will do occasionally, but usually it should be the ocean. I'm always really interested to know what the philosophy is of a business owner when they start off small, how they push themselves forward. Not all of this is a plan, but you see, this develops over time. You start small, that's, I believe, quite normal. and. I have also to say that, uh, you know, we did put these boats on the water, but in commercial terms, they were actually really a failure. We were too early. The commercial yachts were not requested and required at that time. Uh, we went a little bit too far in fulfilling um, rules and regulations that did exist in the commercial world, but did not happen and did not exist in the yachting world. Um, so there were quite a few things that didn't go quite the way that you would have hoped for from, a, from an entrepreneurial aspect. And after about, well, close to 10 years of that, which were fine and, and uh, we are actually the backbone of my network in yachting today, um, I really did then turn from an owner operator to a consultant. So the actual beginning of what today, let's say, would be Ocean Independence was somewhere in 94, 93, 94 when my focus started to be advising clients on yacht ownership, on chartering, on building a yacht and things like that, based, of course, on the experience that we had been collecting, uh, being an owner, operator and a builder of, um, of, of these um, column biomotor sales. And after that, I mean, it was a few years, just uh, two of us with an assistant. Um, and then, well, it was obvious that the market started to change, that you that you needed to be either very small, very boutique, uh, which, which always is interesting and nice, or that you would need to get um, to grow to a certain size in order to become um, you know, an important player in the market. And, and after having been just with an assistant for five, six years, um, I thought that being bigger and being uh, being a bit more important in the market, having a bit more to say, being part of the of the definition of how the market would in, you know develop to some extent as well, that that looked interesting to me and attractive, and so I I started to look into expanding the business. That was sort of like late. That was 1999, 2000, something like that. What? did you see as a company as a result of the pandemic and coming out of it and then straight into this Russian-Ukraine conflict? How has that affected business? Well, it has affected business, of course, in many ways, but let's not forget that um, if, you, if you run a yachting business, then actually the last 10, 15 years have not been without crisis one way or another, you know, whether it's financial crisis or oil crisis or, or Iraq wars or whatever. I mean, there's always something happening and, and if it isn't happening, it's, it's threatening to happen or there's plenty of people telling you that it is about to happen. So you're basically always somewhere, you're always in a crisis mode and it also means you're always looking for survival solutions and and actually that is something that the company benefits a lot from because it keeps you on your toes you try to innovate you try to move forward you try to be efficient and um, and so in that sense in that sense today or the last couple of years have not really been that dramatic what was different in the pandemic is of course to full stop on the charter side in the first half year of you know the pandemic going going around the world and and of course the working from home situation so the fact that people were locked up in their homes um locked out of, of the offices that did change a lot that did change a lot in the in the social interaction between people that changed a lot in how we at ocean independence started to look at our staff at our team um, how we started to look at how to take care of each other, how to how to be, still be in touch with each other, because being at home, of course, is sometimes very nice and is a nice is a nice concept. But then having to be at home is a totally different thing. Not seeing your friends, not seeing your colleagues. For some, it's perfect. For some, it's terrible. And as a company, we started to really think much more about that than. 
And so it has changed, in other words, maybe to say it has changed communication a lot in ocean independence, within ocean independence, but also with our clients. And, and some of it is going to stay. Have you noticed an increase in charter after the pandemic? For, for certain. I think the whole industry has seen a, a dramatic increase in demand. Uh, uh, last year was, uh, was a boom year for the industry, no doubt about it, for the shipyards, for the brokers, whether it was charter brokers or, or sales. Um, we've, we've been having a, a great year as an industry and that was obviously also a great year as ocean independence. And, and um, it, you know, the, the experience to be on a yacht uh, and driven in a way or highlighted in a way indeed by the pandemic, uh, but the, the pluses of, of being able to be on a yacht and experience uh, with your family, with your friends, you know, just to be a, a, a group that knows each other, likes each other, being together, being mobile, not being restricted to local a local regulation, uh, maybe, and then be able to move somewhere else. All these things, of course, are strong sides of yachting and um and, and the pandemic yes indeed it um sort of put them into the limelight even more has the charter guest changed in the past say five years do you see a difference in the type of guests that you're getting on board well that's a that is a it, that's a difficult question to answer because our clients in general are, cannot easily be put into drawers. I you know the, the the variation the variation of clients is enormous. It's uh, we are we are a global company, meaning we are dealing with with clients from really truly all over the world. So um, we we see all cultural expectations and behavior and. And and really, there are no two alike, or hardly two alike. Has it changed a lot? Um, I would say not dramatically. Um, there are you know there are always years where this or that is a bit more um, sort of demanded. But in overall, I would say the change is the requirements have not changed a lot because what people really want to have is a good time. People want to have a good time on board. Now, I'm not talking about having a huge party. That can be a good time for a few, but a good time usually means being together, having fun with each other, um, you know, water sports, go to nice places, eat nice, they be treated well, be pampered uh, according to what you pay, of course. So feel good. And, and, and that hasn't changed. That's always been what you're looking for on a charter. Now, how, how in detail you want then the charge to be that's a different question because you have a you have a, a group of young people and yes they do want to party yes they want to go to the grand prix or they want to go to the beaches and they want to you know go to the places in the evening or you have a family with young children and they want to go to the quiet base and uh, and, and do a bit of swimming and 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 take it very sort of easy in that sense uh, the goal is always the same have fun be safe um, and uh, be in a, in a great environment. The, the overriding general consensus is that you would like to eat well when you're on a charter, that everybody wants to do that. With the next generation coming up, do you think that we're going to see a different generation that aren't necessarily going to be into ownership, but that they're going to want to charter? Um, at Ocean Independence, we have a certain, yeah, we do expect that to a certain extent. Um, whether, you know, whether it is going to be a bit more sharing, so shared ownership a bit more than today, uh, it does exist, but it's not yet extremely uh, popular and widespread. Uh, whether it is more chartering um, as well, that could, that could well be. And of course, you know, I said before, we are always living a little bit in a crisis mode and and you did speak rightly about how yachts uh, how yards are sold out it's all of that of course you can imagine for companies selling boats that's a problem because we actually are looking at the lack of supply at the moment so even though things have been very good last year this year we were sort of a bit concerned i mean as an industry now not not specifically ocean independence um, that our supply chain actually is relatively yeah thin because the yachts have been sold and and the shipyards cannot just keep taking orders because they need to build those boats at some stage and and uh, so that is that is one thing and in and similar so let's let's for the moment uh, you know assume that there will be a huge shift from owning to chartering 
um, that would be a great challenge because what do you charter them? I mean, at the moment we are living in an industry where private owners do make their yachts available for private people to charter yachts. And if you take away the ownership side, then actually there is no more market for chartering yachts. So of course, somebody or more than somebody, but there will be uh, there will be concepts how to make up for that. So I, I think it will be interesting to see what the, the changes are going to bring in the next five to 10 years. But I would agree with you that there's going to be a bit of a change uh, in maybe the percentages of ownership and chartering and maybe also shared ownerships in the future. You know, the world over, especially the, the coming generations, are very, very concerned about the environment. Do you see that being something that people really and truly consider more so in the future than they do now or have in the past five years? I think by default, um, it, it, this will be the case. It has to be the case. And um, and I think it's a good thing that it is the case. And, and as we have seen, in the in the car in the automotive industry of course it takes it takes an offer um in order for people to start thinking whether they would consider it or not and they, as long as you don't have an electric car you cannot ha- buy an electric car and then you don't want an electric car because it doesn't exist and and in yachting we're still at the very beginning of that um, but it will come and we see it of course we see it at various levels whether in the drivetrain arrangements or whether in whole yachts and and we will see more and more and more of that the solutions the the, the the final solutions are not known yet. At the moment, we are in a phase where, where shipyards, engineering companies, um, everybody, owners, um, some some very high profile owners have shown great interest in being part of finding solutions for uh, greener yachts. Um, but we are in the we are at the beginning of the development and the, and in combination with being sort of forced to do a bit more. I think we are going to see great progress in in that area in the next five to ten years for certain. I'm very convinced, and I'm very happy about that because it must be, it must be part of how we look at life and how we look at the at the, at the world and the oceans that we are cruising on that we like so much. So we need to make sure that we preserve that um, for um, well for generations to come. In regards to yacht sales and new build, it's interesting to follow the industry when it comes to new sales, because for the longest time it was who could get the biggest yacht. Then all of a sudden we saw the advent of excursion yachts and expedition yachts. And then it seems to be now going back to bigger yachts, not expedition yachts. It seems to have sort of crossed that bridge and now we're heading back to even mega yachts as, as we see some of the new builds that are coming out now. It is uh, it is what you're looking at, you know. I mean, uh, we at Ocean Independence we have a slightly different, how shall I say, view on that. In the sense that um, that yes, you know, we talk a lot about the bigger yachts and the biggest yachts and everything. But if you if you see, you know, what people want, and and I'm not talking about the ones who only want the hundred meter plus or or eighty meter plus yachts, but if you look at what uh, sort of the sweet spot of the market is, then it is much, much, you know, in a, in a much different area. It is somewhere between 35 and 55 meters. And and personally, um, I think it's fantastic that it's there because that's where you can enjoy your boat most. I mean, that's where your yacht can still go where you would like to be. And uh, and of course, there are good reasons to have a huge yacht if you're the kind of person that needs a big yacht. But for most people, for most of our clients, um, that is not what they are interested in. They are fascinated by it, of course. It's like people are fascinated by very fast cars, but there is very, very few people who actually need a fast car, or even if they have it, who drive fast in a fast car. And and uh, the, the yachting the yachting experience where in my opinion it really peaks is somewhere between 35 55 meters somewhere there that's where you can have the greatest experience with your family with your friends and and go to the places that you that you want to see uh, the, the very big yachts are fascinating they are great pieces of art and technology and then they pull the industry in a way because everybody is fascinated by them and then we read about it with pleasure including myself but it's not what uh, it, it's not where we are as a company and where we can serve our clients best because our clients are are not up there 
sailing was a big thing and proper sailing, proper sailing boats. And it started to drop off. And everybody that I have spoken to, you know, sailing enthusiasts have said that there was a huge dip in the industry as far as sailing boats. People just weren't as interested in sailing as they were in motor yachts. I've noticed that from the monohull uh, sailboat to the catamaran, it seems like that has started to increase people's interest in sailing again because the catamarans, you can sail them and they're also bringing in the electric, the solar panels, et cetera. Do you think that's going to be a change in the future with more of those types of boats being sold? I would expect that, yes. I think um, I, I think that is going to happen for for exactly the reasons that you mentioned. A, you can you can sail uh, with the catamaran without having some of the disadvantages that some people would see in sailing. Uh, personally, I really think sailing is the way to go on a modern hull. But I mean, our clients, 85% of our clients, 90% of our clients uh, think differently. And um, and so that one, one has to take that very seriously. But the catamaran does allow to sail a bit um, without being discomfortable. And of course, as you also pointed out, it does allow with regard to technology to put more solar panels, bigger surfaces, and therefore to be a bit greener in uh, in, in the combination of things. So yes, I expect more of that. Now, whether that is really going to be a big percentage or just a, a slightly less small percentage than it is now, will will really very much depend, I believe, on what other technologies, green technologies are going to come into play. Um, and, and then, of course, there is also the certain likelihood that there might be green catamarans and not necessarily sailing catamarans. Because, um, because sailing really, truly, if one is honest about it, is for the sailing enthusiast. And um, and not for anybody else. Everybody who does, anybody who does not really like sailing should, in my opinion, not have a sailing yacht because the, the cost is proportionally higher. Uh, you need you need sometimes extra queue. You need to know more. You need to maintain more. Um, you know, sailing is sailing is the most fantastic way to be on the water, in my opinion. But if you do not feel like that. There's really no good reason to have a mast and a boom and sails and rigging and uh, and all of that. Well, Peter, it has been an absolutely fascinating conversation as per usual. And I really do appreciate you taking your time to talk with us. It's been a pleasure. No, it's it's my it's my business, it's my passion, you know, being on the water and, and finding solutions for people. Uh, who joined me in that um, in that love? Let's say that that is a great thing. And and again, going back to the beginning, I'm a very lucky person to uh, to, to do exactly that with a, with a team of great people. Where do you see Ocean Independence next? Well, I, I hope that we can be part, um, as we have been at the, in the very early days. You know that we can be part of um, of shaping the future of yachting and that we can uh, be part of bringing nice solutions to the to the market to our clients um, that we can be part of this drive for sustainability and i think part of it has to be growth uh, whether it is growth in quality uh, quantity profitability and sometimes dirty word but also very important in, in business in order to survive um, growth maybe also in our global reach further uh, so growth growth probably is uh, part of that but uh, but i see growth in quality for everybody whether it's clients and uh, and also team members of ocean independence as one of the main goals that I would have for the next years of Ocean Independence. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. If you are interested in finding out more about Ocean Independence, and of course, Peter, who is the founder and managing uh, partner, we will provide his LinkedIn information, uh, but as well, all the social media links for Ocean Independence will be below this interview when it airs. Thank you ever so much for tuning in. My name is Ria. I have been your host. We'll see you again next time.